Hello, I'm Ken Myers, Curator of American Art at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Thank you for joining me and for supporting your DIA. One of my favorite paintings at the DIA is Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket by the American artist James McNeil Whistler. Painted in 1875, The Falling Rocket is one of the most famous paintings at the DIA. Indeed, it is one of the most famous of all American paintings. Whistler was born in Massachusetts and always identified as an American, but he spent most of his life living in London, which is where he painted The Falling Rocket. In the 1870s, he was living on the River Thames in Chelsea near Cremorne Gardens, a private amusement park which featured live dance bands and nightly displays of fireworks. Whistler painted at least six major paintings based on things he saw at the Cremorne, including our painting. I love Falling Rocket for many reasons. One is that it reminds me of my childhood. I grew up 20 miles north of New York City, a few miles from Long Island Sound. Every 4th of July, my parents would pack a picnic dinner, pack my sister and my brother and me into our station wagon and take us to a public park on the Sound to watch the fireworks. And that is what Whistler painted. Near the bottom of the painting, the fire and smoke of the launch. At the top, the rocket has just burst, forming thick, irregular oblongs of color, reds and oranges and greens. Below and to the right of the burst, narrower, thinner shards of orange, red, pink and green cascade down the canvas, evanescent jewels of the night. At the very bottom, so thinly painted as to be ghostly, Next to the dark waters of the river, a few people watch. But while our eyes are drawn to those bright spots of color, what the French call feu d'artifice, artificial fire, the colors stand out only because Whistler has set them within an encompassing darkness that he conjured from thin washes of gray, blue, and green pigments. As the main title, Nocturne in Black and Gold suggests, Whistler was primarily concerned with the visual relationship between the black of the night and the gold of the dying embers. The word nocturne derives from the Latin nocturnus, meaning of night, which by the year 500 was being used to describe the section of the daily Christian liturgy that was chanted late at night. By the late 1700s, Musicians like Mozart were using the word more generally to describe any piece of music that evoked the night. Whistler was the first visual artist to borrow the word, using it to suggest that just as a nocturne by Chopin should be appreciated not as a representation of what, might, of what night looked like, but as an abstracted arrangement of sounds evocative of night. So his painted nocturnes should be understood as abstracted arrangements of lines, colors, and forms evocative of the night. In creating Nocturne Black and Gold, Whistler was seeking to create a beautiful object which was able to provoke a sense memory, a feeling, a feeling of being outside in the dark on a warm, possibly sticky summer night seeing, but also smelling, and hearing, and feeling, and maybe even tasting the brief burst of the rocket and the surrounding darkness. At a deeper level, I think Whistler wanted to suggest something about our experience of time, our desire sometimes to stop it, and our inability to do so. Watching the rocket rise and burst we want the glowing embers to stay in place, to stay there long enough for us to fix them in our memory before they begin their inevitable descent and decay. That we cannot fix them in that way is frustrating. 
maybe even tragic if the evanescence of the fireworks reminds us of the evanescence of all things, including our memories and even our lives. But the fact that they are so fleeting does not detract from the beauty of the fireworks or the meaningfulness of our memories and our lives, but only adds to our sense of their importance and value. In the end, it is because Whistler's Nocturne provokes me into these kinds of thoughts about both beauty and the meaning of life that I love it so much. Nocturne in Black and Gold is famous in part because no one had ever tried to paint in this way before, but also because of the ruckus the painting caused when it was new. Few of Whistler's contemporaries approved of or even understood what he was trying to do. Few liked the painting. Many mocked it. One of the mockers was John Ruskin, by far the most influential art critic of the day in both Britain and the United States. Like many of Whistler's contemporaries, Ruskin believed that paintings should be judged by the accuracy with which they represented things in the world. He saw nothing truthful or moving or beautiful in Whistler's painting. After seeing it for the first time, Ruskin wrote a scathing review, insulting both the painting and the painter, concluding, quote, I have seen and heard much of Cockney impudence before now, but I never expected to hear a coxcomb ask 200 guineas for flinging a pot of paint in the public's face. Whistler was asking 200 guineas for the painting, the equivalent of about $140,000 today. Of course, Whistler was furious. But the action he took was both unexpected and unusual. He sued for libel. The trial was heard over two days in November 1878. It was front page news in all the London newspapers. Several published transcripts of the court testimony. When he was on the witness stand, Whistler used the occasion to explain his novel ideas about art, arguing that artworks should be valued not for their accuracy as representations, but for their beauty as, quote, arrangements in line, form, and color. Asked whether a sketching, asked whether a sketchy, seemingly unfinished painting like Nocturne in Black and Gold, The Falling Rocket, was really worth the 200 guineas he was asking, Whistler famously replied, I am not asking 200 guineas for the labor of one or two days it took me to paint it but rather for the knowledge I have gained in the work of a lifetime that enabled me to paint it in one or two days. Until the late 1800s, artists were usually thought of as high-end artisans, and it was generally assumed that the value of a work of art should be related to the amount of labor that went into its production, plus the cost of the materials used. Think of the cost of the gold leaf used by the medieval, used by medieval and early Renaissance painters like Fra Angelico, or of the rare pigments like the lapis lazuli blue that Fra Angelico used for the Madonna's cloak. Whistler rejected this idea. Instead, he insisted on the now common assumption that the value of a work of art should be based solely on its success as a work of art. Whistler won his case, but received only a farthing, about a penny, in damages, and nothing for his expenses. The cost of the trial drained his already challenged bank account, and six months later, he was declared bankrupt. But he had the last laugh. In 1890, Whistler reprinted transcripts of his court testimony in a widely published book in which he explained and defended his innovative ideas about art. He titled the book, The Gentle Art of Making Enemies. And in 1893, he sold the Nocturne to a New York lawyer for 800 guineas, equivalent to more than $1 million today. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting your DIA.